so hello. Uh, so as Marcelo said, I come from um, the team expression at ERISA in France. So ERISA is a very large laboratory in Rennes, in the west part of France. So I, um, I, my talk will be about gesture, gesture as movement, but also gesture as language. So in this presentation, I will talk about skilled gestures. Uh, those gestures that underlie a language structure, a learning code, uh, and which involve, most of the time, a very long training, such as sign language gestures, that's the first picture, uh, theatrical gestures, and also musical gestures. And uh, I will try uh, to establish some kind of bridge uh, between motion and language. So, identifying what's happening uh, in the body when a person is moving is not an easy task. First, when moving, the person puts its skeleton into action and involves hundreds of muscles, tendons, etc. Furthermore, the person acting is acting interactively with the environment. So, emotion, emotion is thus perceived as closely linked to the physical and to the body space. So, the physical space is the task space or the operational space where the actions are expressed. The body space is uh, the sensory control space where different kinds of information is conveyed uh, and processed. So, among this information, we identified several kinds of information. So sensory information, uh, we have sensory cues such as kinesthetic, proprioceptive, tactile cues, but we have also many other sensory and visual cues when we are doing, when we are moving. But uh, gesture is a specific modality. It has also motor control information uh, I mean by that actions, such as forces and torques, and also a reaction. Most of the time, it's force feedback. So motion researchers, such as biomechanists, neuroscientists, computer animators, roboticians, they adopt a production approach. So they try to build simulation models that imitate real movements, and the approach is from planning levels to the generation of sequences of continuous motion through procedural models. So these people, they know very well about motion, about postures, about motion chunks, but what they need to acquire now is a better knowledge, so better knowledge of the meaningful elements that constitute the movements, and the way they are composed into structural languages. That's the main problem now in robotics. They also need uh, to a better knowledge on the rules which are governing the human behavior and the concepts behind natural languages. Conversely, linguists have an analysis approach. They work also on gestural languages, but from observation of motion through video data, for instance, to the formation of meaning. So these people try to build a theory describing some kind of mapping between the observations and the linguistic elements, uh, such as, for instance, the phonetic items, the phonological items, the signs, the structural patterns, etc. So, in order to validate their observations and analysis, linguists need to have a better knowledge of the, on the motor control principles. I mean motion uh, invariants, sensory motor processes, underlying the physical system that produces the movement. They also need to have a better knowledge on the mapping between the language units and the motion chunks. So, we go from a symbolic 
representation space, which is discrete, to a continuous representation space, which is motion. So, before going further into our methodological approach and the focus of our work, I will explore rapidly the main principles underlying the perception of bio biological movement and also the movement notations and languages. Then, uh, I will present three main focus uh, and we will study the corresponding movements with motion capture data. So the focus, you will see this later, will be on sign language gestures uh, with a specific application on signing avatars. Uh, the second focus will be on expressive gestures with physical theater. And the third one will be musical gestures with two case studies, uh, rapidly the percussive gestures and also the conducting gestures. So concerning the motion notations, um, I have to, to say something about the typologies of gestures. So Kendan was the first to propose a typology of semiotic gestures. So he made the hypothesis of a continuum according to the information which is conveyed by the gestures and whether speech is present or not. So he goes from gesticulation quasi-linguistic gestures, pantomime, emblems, and signs from the signed languages. There's also McNeil in 1992 who proposed another classification. So uh, he introduced iconic, metaphoric, beating, cohesive, deictic gestures, and emblems. I won't have time to go into each kind of these different gestures. I'm trying to, to give an, a global overview of the problem. So different notations uh, have been developed by different communities using skilled movements, such as dance, musical gestures, or sign languages. Generally, these experts in motion have tried to find a way to code and to transcri transcribe the gestures with the aim to store these gestures and to analyze them. Most of the time, the transcription is done through notation system, specification languages, graphical languages, or computational languages. According to the gesture domain, different levels of abstraction can be defined. We have atomic actions, actions or meaningful gestures, that would be for maybe more command gestures. Uh, for example, uh, commands uh, which are used uh, in some specific um, tasks. We have also some kind of con coding units of actions, uh, which are um, present when we are transcribing musical scores. We have also linguistic units. I mean phonetic, phonological units, signs, phrase, etc. So among the main notation systems, uh, the Laban notation is one of the most used in the world. So Laban was a dance artist and theorist and a pioneer of modern dance in Europe. He developed what is called Laban notation in 1928 as a means of archival notation and movement analysis. So Laban notation uses abstract symbols to define First, the direction and level of movement. You can see on the up left corner uh, some schemata indicating how he tries to represent this um, information, the direction. On the uh, down uh, left corner, you have the level of movement, which uh, higher parts of the body, the middle part of the body, or uh, the lower part of the body. Uh, he also tries to code uh, so different parts of the moving body, but also the duration of movement uh, and the dynamics of movement. So the expressiveness is, uh, ex is uh, expressed in this last component, the dynamics of the movement with the effort parameter. I will talk about that later. So you can see on the uh, right uh, down corner two examples 
uh, of the um, lab annotation system. It's much more complicated than that, but uh, this is very two small examples. So, Benesh notation, it's based on a linguistic approach to, trans to transcribe dance ballet. So it defines a basic alphabet with keyframe postures along a temporal line. So we are very close from people doing animation, pioneers people coming from the animation uh, of, uh, of skeletons. So the body representation is inspired from the proportion system of the human body. And the timing representation is very analogous to a musical score. So, like a little in lab notation, the timing information looks like a little the musical score timing. So, uh, we have other notation systems. Uh, I have written some Eschcore and Delsart notation system on my slide, but I won't have time to, to talk about these systems. Um, other sign language notation systems, among them, hypnosis is a pictographic notation system which is based on a phonetic representation using custom symbols with diacritics. We can see an example of hypnosis here. It's very difficult to understand and to decode this kind of, uh, of system of notation. Another system of notation which is used in sign language is sign writing which is also a pictographic system using pictographic symbols. So concerning the perception of biological motion, I will present some invariant lo motion law that have been shown in the last decades and which represent elements of abstraction underlying the sensory motor control of the hand movements. So among these logs, there is a predictive model cited as FITS law, which is very uh, used uh, in human-computer interaction. This empirical law tries to predict that the duration required to reach simply a target is proportional to the index of difficulty of the task, which is also a logarithmic function of the ratio between the distance to the target D and the width of the target W. So that's a very simple law and it, it's very useful in HCI and in ergonomics. Uh, in contrast to point-to-point -point movements, drawing movements are more or less continuous movement in time, as illustrated in the drawings on the left of my, of my, of my slide. So uh, this law, uh, which is uh, proposed by Viviani, uh, showed, which is called the power law, shows that the tangential velocity is related to the local radius of curvature of the pass, and it's called the power law. So that's a very simple kinematic law, which is also very useful nowadays, and uh, I heard yesterday during the workshop that people are using it for... Uh, for some gesture accompanying sound or for perceptual evaluation of sound and gesture. So in this uh, power law, I forgot to say that the gain factor K uh, can be used uh, as a possibility to segment the trajectories with different values of K. So uh, people have largely used this in drawing movements and in random drawing too. There are other motion invariances laws. It has been shown that the velocity profile of the hand tends to be bell-shaped, while the velocity profile of shoulder and elbow angular motions are temporally correlated. Other optimization principles say that it's possible to predict the time course of reaching movement by specifying only three points, the starting point, the intermediate five point, and the final position. Another 
optimization principle called the minimum jerk, which is very useful too, constrains movement to follow in an optimal way a smooth time course. For point-to-point -point movements, the minimum jerk model ensures that among all the possible solutions for generating a trajectory, the motor control system chooses the one that minimizes the smoothness of the movement. This leads to the minimization of a global cost function expressed in terms of the mean square of the jerk quantity. So the jerk quantity is a derivative of the acceleration, in fact. Uh, this law is very useful, especially for musicians' uh, gestures, such as, for example, a harpist gesture. In contrast to this model, other researchers postulate that movement optimizes uh, not um, kinematic quantity, but the rate of change of joint torques. Uh, finally, uh, these, uh, these researchers also show that the... Um, Power law from Viviani, the minimum jerk from Flash and Hugen, and the last one from Uno and Kawato uh, have the same cause, in fact. They come from the same uh, physical model. So, in order to bridge the gap between motion and language, we see that the domains are very different, the people are very different, the methodologies and the models are quite different. So in order to bridge this gap, I will propose a perception production approach developed all along our research theories and application with two main process streams. I call them the decoding and the encoding processes. So what is the decoding processes. It uses the observation of the motion to interpret, to translate the coded information into a comprehensible system. The receiver is trying to reconstruct the language by interpreting the visual cues, by extracting significant symbols and giving the meanings to these symbols into a whole global patterns. In the encoding process, conversely, the encoder uses verbal symbols, for example, rules from artificial intelligence, or words, or signs, and nonverbal symbols, such as body language, hand gestures, facial expression, that have been previously determined and are understand understandable by the receiver. So the global decoding and encoding processes share something in the middle, which, is, which I call the linguistic stack. So I will try to, um, uh, to precise a little more these ideas. So in the process of decoding, what we identify are two main aspects in the analysis module. The signal analysis, which try to extract the motion laws, I was talking about these motion laws, and the invariants in the motion. The pattern analysis, which are um, the annotation, the classifiers, the recognition system, which try to uh, extract the forms and the patterns. So it should be noted that the annotation can be done manually or automatically. If we are looking uh, to, toward the, the other string of information, the linguistic decoding supposes several levels of abstraction. So the motor programs identify the meaningful parameters of the motion laws. Uh, the extraction of the linguistic cues leads to an interpretation and a translation of the recognized information into symbols and concepts, and give meanings to this symbol and concept. And uh, the linguistic patterns, they try to reconstruct the symbols into global patterns or schemata. 
So these three different decoding uh, steps, I did not uh, give a, a strict uh, direction in this. You will see that in a different uh, application, we will speak about always the motor programs or linguistic symbols or linguistic patterns, but they have potentially different uh, term, different names, uh, di there are different models in the different application fields. In the process of encoding, we have an inversion of the linguistic stack somewhere. So in the language module, we go from high-level languages to simple motor programs and to common parameters that can be interpreted by the synthesis module. In the synthesis module, we generally have a sensory, model, a sensory motor model uh, expressed as an inversion system that converts the sensory information into control data applied to the different controllers that drive the virtual character. Uh, so, in this synthesis module, in this sensory motor loop, I didn't talk about that, but this is the brain which is uh, uh, involved, of course. And the use of, a, of an animated virtual character is a way to visualize the produced motion. So, the global decoding and encoding processes are presented in a whole in this slide. They will be declined according to the intended goals of the studies and the content of the gestures. So, our first focus is about sign language. So there is no sound <laughs> during this uh, presentation. These languages, uh, they belong to some family of what we call visual gestural languages. They were initially intended as means of communication between deaf people. So our motivation is to understand the main mechanisms of these fully-fledged gestural languages. First, to decode the language by answering two main questions. What, the first one is, what are the meaningful symbolic elements composing the language? The second is how these elements are combined to form signs or significant utterances. And also, then concerning the motion encoding, what we want to know is how the linguistic elements can be translated into postures or motion chunks. So we have all the problem here in this uh, uh, sign language studies. So, Let's start with a small video. Pour les jours gris, cherche un ami. Les jours de grand soleil, tout est plus facile. Avec la belle ombre qu'il nous fait, si noire et si légère, si légère à tirer. So sign language are expressed simultaneously on multiple channels, as you could see, including uh, not only the left and right hands, but also the, f the face, the body, and the gaze direction. So each channel is itself multi-level, that is, it can be decomposed into sub-channels. For example, the right hand can be decomposed into the placement and the hand configuration, or the facial expression gathers the mouthing, uh, the affective expressions, or the gaze direction. So when annotating manually sign language phrases, li linguists have to annotate each channel separately, which is a very, very long process. So let's see what is the encoding process according to a commonly accepted grammar. So among linguistic elements, uh, there are phonological components which have been defined by Stockholm in 1972. These phonological components include the hand placement, the place where the gesture occurs, the hand configuration, the hand shape, the hand movement, the palm orientation, the facial expression, 
and I forgot also the gaze direction. So, as examples of such description, I will give only the case of the hand configuration and the facial expression. In the case of hand configuration, a set of finite hand shapes are defined in each sign language, one for each country, in fact. So, for French sign language, we consider a set of about 60 hand shapes, and in the presented study, we retrain 33 for a specific corpus of these hand shapes, with a specific label for each hand shape. If looking towards the facial expression, facial expression represents a, a whole channel by itself, which conveys elements of sense. So when signers express joy or angriness, that doesn't mean that they are happy and angry, but that the description of the scene they are signing uses this information as a specific phoneme. For example, describing an accident, you won't express joy, but rather sadness. In the same way, facial expression conveys other information, such as negation, interrogation, which represent the closal channel. Other channels could be added, such as adjectival, or uh, expressing an adverb or quality, mouthing, gaze direction, and so on. So for this presentation, I will only consider this affective channel. The linguistic patterns, we were speaking about the linguistic atomic elements, but now the linguistic patterns. They can be represented by structural patterns uh, that uh, we can draw with some kind of multi-channel annotation. So, for instance, for a specific sign, we can annotate hand movement and hand configuration with the two uh, right hand configuration and hand movement um, tracks, where you can see uh, the different elements that have been annotated. Uh, so there's only two um, tracks, but we could have four tracks, one for each hand. And we could also add a specific track for the hand expressions. And for the hand expression, we can decompose it into two subcomponents. For instance, with the affective facial expression. Here we see joy, neutral, surprise, and green, neutral, surprise, etc. We can annotate on the whole phrase. And also we can have on the close all track, we can have declarative, negative, interrogative, etc. So if we gather everything, all these different tracks, we can have some uh, kind of phonetic schemata for the signs. So that has been um, uh, described by linguist people such as Johnson. And you can have for a whole, a whole phrase uh, different kinds of decompositions with the introduction into the sequences of uh, signs and transitions between the signs. So this work can be, can be done manually by linguists. But an example um, of automatic annotation uh, will be given in the next slide. So I will give the case of the hand configuration and maybe the facial expression annotation, if I have time. So for hand configuration, we have to define a set of a, a good descriptor, in fact. So these descriptors for the hand, it's very intuitive. What we did is to take a set of distances between the wrist, the finger joints, and the hand palm. So we have more than 300 uh, distances. Then, uh, using these distances, we can try to segment automatically the signals of the motion capture by using the variations of the distances with specific threshold. So you can see that this is very simple to segment it automatically by this uh, approach. And that's uh, on the signal, which are real signals here. You see that the phases of the movement are very easy to see. So once we have done that, the recognition system is achieved most of the time by machine learning approaches. 
using, for instance, KNN, or log logistic regression, or random forest uh, methods. So we can see here uh, on the left um, sample of different hunt configurations, and on the right uh, we have traced something which is which say the um, recognition rate, which is the accuracy in person from zero to one hundred percent, in relationship to the subset of distances. So now we can see here if, that if we have only twenty nine distances we still have a good recognition rate. But if we have all the distances, 325, we have still a good, but a good recognition rate, but it's a lot of processes. So through this recognition process, along with the previous segmentation, we are able to extract the segment with the associated labels. So this is called the labeling process according to the previously defined vocabulary and the, of the main hand configurations. We can see on this slide that there is a good recognition rate, 86% for the first example, and 81% for the second example. The performance is quite similar to the manual annotation process, which will avoid us this tedious process of manual annotation. So in the second process, the, sign, uh, which, the phrase which is signed is the child is named Antoine, and Antoine is completely spelled. He lives with his parents. And we annotate, we segment only the hand configuration. We can do the same with all the channels. So I don't think I have time to speak about facial expressions, so I will go towards the encoding system. So if we consider now the process of encoding from language specification to motion production. So to do that, we define a concatenative synthesis approach, which could be compared to what we do when we synthesize speech or musical sounds. So now we can use a speech synthesizer that use very small chunk of speech uh, each chunk is a phoneme, or two or three phonemes, etc. And we combine them and we form speech. We can do this with uh, auditory signals and combine some signals like that. But we can do the same with movement. So the idea is very simple. We just combine motion chunks, but we have to take into account the multi-channel aspect. It's not like a sound signal. We have several multi-level uh, signals. So we have to take into account this multi-channel aspect of the motion so that we keep the global coherence of the produced movements and in particular we want to avoid some kinds of artifacts in the animation and we have to deal with some kind of co-articulation that is taking into account what is before the movement and what is after the movement. And we do have to do this, we have to do that for each channel hand configuration, hand movement, facial expression, etc. And also we have to do uh, to keep the coherency of the set of the different channels with blending approaches, for, for instance. So let's see now uh, how, with such a system, we can build new utterances. So in the encoding process, we said what, that we can go from a language specification system, very high level, and go towards the motion postures generation. So first, by replacing signs or group of signs in the editing process, uh, we can build something. I gave a, a very simple exams, example. So the train from the departure city one to the arrival city two is delayed due to a specific cause. So you see in blue, and in pink, the city and the coast, that we can replace these elements in the phrase. So if we have recorded specific sentences of train incidents, then uh, we can uh, enrich our initial mocap database by other uh, sentences, uh, replacing the town's names by other towns or by number of trains, and replacing the causes by different type of causes. 
So we can automatize uh, a lot of uh, processing. So the, um, here we have a global science treatment, but we can uh, edit uh, and we can refine this editing process. So by using the multi-channel view of the signs, we can indeed modify the phonological components of signs. So here, what I call the phonological components is the hand shapes. If we want, in the sim simple phrase, I give you a thin glass, or I give you a large glass, it's, the sim it, it's nearly the same phrase, but instead of giving a very thin glass with a hand shape with a very thin, a specific hand shapes, and if you say, I give you a large glass, then you modify only the hand shapes. The movement is the same, the hand placement is the same, and the hand orientation is the same too. So, these are simple treatments that we can uh, introduce into our system. Other editing uh, processes, for, exam for example, I like, I don't like. So this is French Sign Language and not ASL, American Sign Language. But they very uh, similar. So here we just alter one specific component, which is the motion stroke. The motion stroke is what we call a phonology component too. So I could do the same with the verb I give or I take. I give it to you or you give it to me. So if I reverse the sign, I do another sentence. So this is quite different from the natural process uh, of language processing. But this is quite specific languages that use the space. So for signing avatars, what we want to do generally is to combine these very little motion chunks and construct new, new sentences. So, for example, here I have a sentence which is, what do you want? I like fruit juice. And the other person say, what, what do you propose to me? And you want to change this by, what do you want? I don't like orange juice. I propose you orange cocktail. So you can build things like that. So here we have the impression that it's uh, signed, um, the signs are just in sequence, but it's more subtle than that. I, I showed you that we have to uh, modify also the phonological elements, and when we put everything together, probably there will be a lot of artifacts. So that's the kind of thing that we can uh, do. And the results uh, can be seen here. I won't have time to, to go further here. Here is just two slides of some work that uh, uh, Clément Reverdi, who is a PhD student working with me, did. So here you can see the link between um, the facial expression uh, with a mocap system, with the markers on the face, and what we propose here. is to um, synthesize the face. So what he did is to make a kind of retargeting, I, I mean a morphological adaptation, so that it's possible to... Okay, so this is for the affective, happy and uh, angry expressions. So, to finish with this part of sign language, um, the avatar can sign the specific uh, phrase, which are not into our corpus, but which are completely reconstructed. So you see that you have the hand motions, you have the facial expression, you have the gaze direction. This is not perfect, of course, because we do not have a professional graphist with us. <laughs> we should have. <laughs> but um, it's still with the motion, it's okay. So, I will, t I will talk now about emotion in motion. So this is co completely different. So the, motiv the motivation here. So humans here perceive and express emotions through the combination of verbal and non-verbal modalities such as speech, gaze, facial expression, and bodily movements. 
So in this study, it's completely different. We wanted to know how the expressiveness is encoded into full body motions. Indeed, since our bodies and the medium through which we experience the world around us, this, uh, mo this full body movement, they represent a very relevant modality when designing engaging interactions. So, we also wanted to know if there was a good subset of features that best characterize the expressiveness, and in particular, we showed that N extremity trajectories could efficiently contain most, if not all, the expressive content. So these end extremity trajectories, hand trajectories, feet, head, and information of the pelvis uh, were sufficient. We showed that they were sufficient to represent uh, the expressiveness content. So I won't talk a lot about this uh, study, just to show you what we did. So we built a motion database containing full body motion with the aim to design applications when the humans interact with human characters. So what we took is physical theater, I mean, um, which privileges the use of the human body and the wide variety of movements and postures. We recorded various types of movements of several professional actors, and in the chosen movements, we made sure that all the body limbs were employed with large kinematic variations. Here we can see on the Russell circle here that we took four main uh, emotions uh, in each quarter, I mean stressed, with um, pleasure, negative pleasure, and positive arousal, happy, sad, and relaxed. An example of a happy movement. So this represents a magic trick done by a musician, which is showing a trick about uh, the disappearing box, in fact. <laughs> So you can see this. So just a little on the beginning. So this is the sad movement. So in this decoding process, we wanted to find the best feature set to recognize the emotion. So we do not want to recognize the action, but the emotion regardless the semantics of the action. So that's completely different. So what we want to know is which joint should we use and which window, temporal window, should we use. And to go further, which features for specific joints over a temporal window. So we took, as we said in the motion laws, we took kinematic features, geometric features, and lab and effort for the expressiveness. And for a whole sequence of motion, for one motion chunk, we took all these descriptors, one per frame, and a mean and standard deviation approach for a motion chunk. And what we did is the recognition of uh, these emotions within movement. So what we did here is to try to recognize um, the full body movement or just the end extremity movements, and to see if we were able to still recognize the emotion. Uh, we had nearly the same results for the single subject, 75%, which is good for the recognition of emotion, and 73 for a single subject if we have only end extremities. And we had another study for the synthesis part. So we try to have three sources of information. The first one is the mocap data. The second one is the motion which is reconstructed only from the end extremity. And the third one, it's a little speci specific because it's a randomly generated motion. And we try to see if it was um, possible to recognize the emotion with these three kinds of uh, sources. And what we, say, what we see is that 
uh, we are able, with the automatic recognition system, to recognize the emotion. We have about 79% for mocap, 75% for the reconstructed motion from the end extremity trajectories, and 63% for the random motion. And the perceptual evaluation uh, which is given with the same motion gives lower results. So this is kind of strange, <laughs> but that's because the classifier using uses much more data than uh, the participants in the perceptual evaluation, because they get tired, so we can't show them too much data. So what we have here, just to show you, uh, this I show this to you because it's um, the originali originality of this work is... Uh, uh, you see the natural movement mocap on the top of the slide, and on the down part of the slide, you see only the presentation of the trajectories. So generally, we see point line movements, but not trajectories like that. And here, uh, I talked about uh, random motion. So in the left uh, up corner, it's mocap data, and in the other three quarters, it's random generated motion. So there's no semantics. And we saw that it's possible to recognize emotion when there is no semantics at all. So let's go. I don't have to <laughs> musical gestures. So the aim of this project uh, was to study percussion gestures. So this is a work which has been done with people from here, Ed Mill with Marcelo Vandole and Fabrice Marandola. The idea was to uh, decode the motion uh, to, uh, and to encode these percussive gestures. Now, the idea also was to use a virtual uh, percussionist in order to help musicians understand their performances. Uh, so the virtual character is like a pedagogical avatar, in fact. And we had an analysis recognition system used to uh, validate all the motions, all the models. So here you see that we do not have the decoding, but most of all the encoding system. So what we did here... Forte, petit forte. So, we built a specific database, and we can see that we have mocap data too. Uh, here I can show you... I won't show this to you, maybe. So, this is also the motion that we uh, recorded <laughs> with this database, and we see that here it's just mocap data. So this is interesting because you can try to do some uh, perceptual evaluation with that. So in these percussive gestures, we had a lot of different variations, musical variations such as articulation variations, location variations of the melodic stick, dynamic variations from piano to mezza forte and forte, and tempo variations. And we had also physical simulation. So for the motion simulation, for the sound simulation, and also for the interaction between the motion and the sound. So just a result to see what we did. So from language to production system, so we can see easily what we did here. We had the language. The language is represented, in fact, by the, the indication and the score. Uh, each note, in each stroke, is converted into a specific motion chunk. Uh, and we are trying to edit these motion chunks. Then the simulation system inverses, uh, inverts these motion trajectories to form uh, motion for the avatar. So 
we had some kind of results of the percussion gesture. You can see that. So that's a little specific because uh, when you see the target, the yellow target, uh, that's a little um, uh, disturbing when we see the motion. So a uh, last study, which is a very, I will be very short about, uh, about this. Uh, it's some uh, ongoing work on condu conducting gestures. So I will show what uh, interests interest us only in this small video. <laughs> So um, we are not interested by the beating movement, but by the expressive movement with the left hand. So that's what we are trying to, to record. And uh, we um, built a specific corpus of conducting gestures. So the motivation was to control interactively sound without any instrument. The gestures are completely inspired from conducting gestures. And uh, we uh, focus on the expressiveness performed by the non-dominant hand. I mean the left hand most of the time by the left-handed persons. So we define a lexicon of gestures and their variations. Among these variations, we have a finite set of uh, functional, operational gestures having a specific function, like articulation gestures, cut-off gestures, attack gestures, or dynamic gestures. So what is interesting is that all these gestures are very short gestures, very short command gestures, like strokes. So among these functional categories, we have different variations. For articulation, um, we have lié, piqué, tenuto. For the cutoff, we have hard or soft cutoff. For the attack gesture, we have hard or soft attack. And for the dynamic variation, we have different kinds of crescendo or decrescendo. And uh, I will show you what uh, interests us also is the structure of the gestures. So the gestures are, um, look like, in their structure, sign language gestures. I mean, we have hand configurations uh, five hand configuration, and we have different kinds of hand movements, which are shown there. Lié, piqué, tenuto, cut-off, attack, intensity. So, what is interesting us also is, uh, so we have different sounds that we chose, and uh, is the protocol, the experimental protocol that we used. So, concerning this protocol, the subject is learning the gestures from demonstration, he or she is observing the movement performed by an expert musician. And then, after the training session, the user has to perform each gesture by hearing the musical excerpt. So this is a demonstration uh, system. So the musical excerpts are played as many times as necessary, and the subject is instructed to execute the corresponding gestures according to a specific musical effect. So for each variation, it's either the same musical excerpt or uh, there can be different musical excerpts. So I will give some examples so that you can see, you can understand. So this is for the articulation lié. So I want to precise that these are not especially musician people <laughs> which are doing the gestures. The expert was doing the gestures, but then the students recorded it. 
So that's the tenuto. So with this uh, information, it's possible to uh, uh, try to um, classify the different gestures and to validate the data set uh, through recognition. So we take the same methodology here. So the first, uh, the first results uh, are rather good because we had 90% uh, of recognition. This is a two-level recognition system. With first, um, the first level is the functional gestures recognition. We we'll try to recognize at articulation attack intensity cutoff. And then we uh, try to detect the different variations. So the other expected result uh, will be the perceptual evaluations and the controlling synthesized sounds through real-time recognition. So I will conclude, because I think I'm a little late. Um, so over these last years, we studied gestures having a strong semantics and expressiveness. So, it must be emphasized that every gesture is a field of research in itself, be it sign language, physical theater, or musical gestures. So, what we proposed is a methodological approach for the decoding and encoding processes. Uh, this directed us towards the extraction of meaningful components of motion in the decoding process and uh, the use of these components to resynthesize motion in the encoding process. We also developed tools for specific analysis synthesis models adapted to the gestures. So in these tools, we developed also avatar technology, which help us validate the analysis hypothesis and the synthesis models. And we developed methods for selecting descriptors for each channel, for segmentic processes, for recognition methods, for labeling, etc. And next. <laughs> so there's still a lot of work to be done, whether experimental or theoretical. So what is certain is that we must make people work together. Movement scientists, musicians, dancers, linguists, in order to better understand the mechanisms of the decoding and encoding processes. We also have to develop multi-layer approaches, defined spatially and temporally, as most of the time gestures involve several modalities, not only hand and body movements, but also facial expressions, gaze direction, etc. Even the conductor is able to use his facial expressions. And furthermore, the structural linguistic patterns can be defined at several levels, from atomic elements of sense to words, like signs, groups of notes, and to the, general, to the gestural phrases. So thank you.